First of all, where are my glasses? I will have to do a break and find them in a second, but I wanted to make sure that everything works, and it seems it works. So, welcome after a break. The break has been rather long, right? Okay, so I can hear myself on YouTube and you can probably hear the feedback in the mic because I didn't connect my, yeah, my headphones yet. Yeah, you know, the first stream after coming back from vacation, it's usually like, how did I start the stream? What do I need to run? What do I need to find? And so on. Where is my moderator? So, um, yes, but in the end, welcome back. I will have to run for my glasses in a second, though. Um, but before we get there, today's moderator is going to be Kshaku, but he's going to be here a little late, but he will get here. So if you have any questions, uh, do type exclamation mark Q on IRC, or if you are on YouTube chat, then do type, well, I, I guess you'll have to wait in that case, because, well, Kshaku has to be here to actually pass the questions on to me. Anyway, so today's topic is going to be nanomites, and if you're wondering what are nanomites, it's actually the same thing I was wondering when I saw the topic being proposed, because, well, um, this is a topic which has been proposed by uh, the viewers, one of the viewers in the comments probably. And yeah, and I saw it and I was like, what's nanobytes? And so I started Googling and I was like, oh, like, yeah, the bugger, the buggy scheme. I know that. I've written an article about that like 10 years ago or 15 years ago or whatever. So um, yeah, I know the subject. I didn't know the name nanomites though. And um, but this is something we'll be discussing today. The general idea is basically that you have a, you want to do some anti-reverse engineering. You want to make reverse engineering harder and therefore uh, you use this technique. And the technique goes uh, like this. It You basically start with um, having a process and the process spans another process, a child process. So now you have two processes. And the child process is actually being debugged by the parent process, where the parent is the debugger and the child is the debuggy. And um, the debuggy, the child, has some functionality in the code replaced by instructions, which cause whatever exception signal CPU fault that result in actually, um, well, crashing, but not really crashing because the debugger is attached. So that means signaling the debugger. And then the debugger receives the signal and sees, oh, this is like, um, I don't know, like UD2, like undefined opcode on this address. This means that I have to change the AIX register in the child to this value and like, I don't know, add ECX and EDX. So like basically emulate some functionality and then restart the child or actually not restart, like continue the execution of the child. So I guess in short, the idea is that you create your own CPU instructions inside the debuggy, the child, and um, but the instructions are actually being implemented inside the debugger. So each time the child wants to execute such an instruction, a CPU fault is being raised, and the debugger emulates that instructions and returns the execution to the child. So that's the general idea. And uh, yeah, we're going to try to implement something like that. I haven't implemented this for, yeah, like, for years, basically. It's a pretty popular technique, by the way. It was on Google CTF qualification in one of the reverse engineering challenges uh, by, by, by Kevin. It was, um, I think it was used in like StarCraft 2 when it came out as well. Some protectors, I think, also implemented it. So it, it's pretty popular. It's been out there for years. It's also a pretty obvious technique if you, if you think about it. I'm not really sure who originally, like, invented it or I first came to, to implement this. But uh, the idea itself is pretty, yeah, it, it's pretty, pretty simple. So I'm pretty sure like a lot of people discovered it uh, simultaneously. So yeah, this is what we will be talking about today. And I'm going to switch back to some music and I will run for my glasses. So we can then, well, I guess we can, we can start with, uh, we, we can do some questions, like, uh, before Shaku is here, I am going to watch the chat. But give me one second, I'm going to leave you with some music and be right back. So, what are we going to listen to? Well, it won't take too much time.
I told you it wouldn't take too much time. Now I do need my portal with further questions. I forget to open it. This is like, yeah, like seriously, first live stream after a break and this happens. So, um, <laughs> if you have any questions on chat for the time being, do um, use my nickname, like Ginvale EN with a, with a, you know, um, what is it called? At sign at the beginning. And uh, let's switch to the desktop. Yes, um, and I'm going to chat about random stuff as usual until 15 past, because 15 past is when we are going to to start actually. Um, yeah, start again. Stream crashed. Okay, it should be back up in a second. Why Pro chose not Terran? Uh, I guess you saw my t shirt. So it's, it's a good question. It's a perfect question. Um, in all honesty, in StarCraft 1, I did play Protoss. In StarCraft 2, I, I did play Terran, but my heart is with Protoss. So yeah, that's why this t-shirt. Okay, back to the desktop. Oh okay, yeah, random stuff. Um, you know, I was on vacation and my vacation was quite funny because it began with uh, Moon Eclipse and I we actually went with my wife and did a couple of photos. So yeah, this is one of the photos I made. Uh, or my wife made, I don't know, like some of us, someone of us made. It's, uh, it's not bad. I did use 500 millimeters on a Nikon camera for it. This is by way low resolution, I have no idea where I have high resolution. Oh, I know. Um, let me launch the browser. Okay, here we go. If we go to my blog, then emg moon Yes, here we go. Yeah, this is a higher resolution, but way more noisy. So yeah, we, we really enjoyed the eclipse. Like the weather was beautiful and we, yeah, we, we had the proper setup. So a couple of really cool photos. Uh, we have a couple of really cool photos. I'm wondering what is this thing? Because uh, yeah, I don't know, it was probably some satellite or it wasn't a plane. It, it was moving too slow for a plane. It was probably some satellite or something. I don't know. Uh, there was some some time where you could see like the moon and the Mars, which which was also really I, I really liked it. And then my vacation actually ended with um, meteorites. We also went again with the camera out and um, yeah, this is I think like I'm sure this is a meteorite. I'm not sure what is this. You know, a falling star, right? Uh, this is long exposure. That's why it's a line. It was a line like when you saw it, it was pretty amazing, I really liked it. And, and these two, if you can see the, the small lines here and here, these are actually airplanes. I think they're landing in, in Zurich airport. So yeah, this is UFO. Uh, this might be a meteorite or I don't know, I'm pretty sure it's not an airplane. Airplanes look a little different. And I also have this photo on my, on my website. If you go here to Meta, all right, uh, written in Polish, Meta audit. Yeah. It's, it's pretty high resolution, by the way. Yeah. yeah, and you can see like, like the Earth's rotation, right? Uh, because the, this is by, uh, somewhere here is the North Star, which is basically the axis of rotation. Uh, uh, which means that if this is the axis, then if you look here, uh, oh wait, I have to zoom in actually, the stars due to long exposure are actually like horizontal lines. But if you look here, they are more like vertical lines because you know, it, it, it like rotates. So yeah, that's quite amazing to see it. Yeah, but weather was fine as well. And we, <laughs> we did see a couple of, of falling stars here with us. I really enjoyed it. Apart from that, I did play a lot of RPG games. Uh, well, mostly Pillars of Eternity to Dead Fire. It's pretty amazing. I, I really loved it and I finished it. So um, it should be fine. Did you delete the exif data? So, oh, this is this is a great question there, best survivor. Uh, there is no GPS ex exif data on these photos. That being said, I'm almost positive that uh, on the photo of uh, with uh, high resolution meteorite, you can, due to the positioning of the stars and the lights 
that you see in the background in the hills, you can uh, pinpoint the location and I, where I was doing the photos. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's, it's not really a secret. It's the Zurich area in Switzerland, so so yeah, um, there you have it. But I'm I'm actually wondering if you could do it. Like, how would you approach it technically? If somebody figures it out, then let me know. Okay, uh, let, let's see. There are a couple of questions. Um, have you heard about one L one TF for Shadow back in Intel CPU? Uh, who hasn't? But uh, I did read the headlines. I didn't read the paper yet, so no idea. Mm. So is it photoshopped? Uh, the, the, the photos, they are not photoshopped. They there were some like lightning tweaks in the um, in in Lightroom. But that's that's basically a must. If you think about how a camera works technically, doing like exposure changes in Lightroom is it's not really editing the photo. I would say it's more like developing it. It's actually a really interesting thing because the, these cameras make grayscale images, which isn't really obvious, but they have a Bayern pattern filter in front of a sensor, which means that um, the, the pattern is basically like, for example, red, green, green, blue in, in squares. And there is like every pixel, um, sorry, yeah, every pixel is be before one square and each square has a different color. Therefore, when light is passing through the filter, it actually the wavelengths, which are, for example, not green are, are being cut out. So in the end, you get a grayscale picture of a mosaic, right? And each pixel is then interpolated from a couple of different pixels to get the all three RGB uh, wavelengths mixed together. And that's how you get color images. But like, Deep down, it's actually a grayscale image. So if, if anything about it, it's like pretty obvious that some some development needs to be done before you get a colorful image. And if you think that, well, our LCDs are like usually eight bits, unless you're a pro, uh, like pro designer or something like that, then, then you might have a, a higher resolution per color LCD. But the cameras we used have, I think like 12 or 14 bits of depth. So we have quite a lot of more information there to choose from. Uh, do you use IDA for dynamic static analysis or both? Um, I actually use it for, oh wait, um, I totally forgot that I will not hear my moderator unless I join our chat. Okay. I'm going to answer that question in a second. Okay. Okay. So, uh, do you use IDA for dynamic static analysis or both? I use it for static analysis only. I um, I sometimes rarely use it for dynamic analysis, but I prefer other debuggers. I prefer like plain old GDB for um, like with Pwn, DBG or whatever plugins for um, for Linux and for Windows X64 DBG or sometimes Win DBG. But if you're watching these streams, you do know that I am terrible at actually using it. Mm. Uh, difference between SHA3 and SHA256. So SHA is actually, it's, it's a standard, which means that um, multiple people, multiple parties actually suggest their own algorithm, which they invented for the standard. And then for a couple of years, I think it actually takes quite a long time, uh, people are trying to break each other's algorithms and like the algorithms which were submitted for the competition. And then in the end, the next standard is being chosen. So, so yeah, uh, like I'm not sure what which standard was chosen for SHA3 but it might be something totally different than SHA 256. I'm not a cryptographer by heart so I, I cannot answer like the technical details of it you would have to check the implementation it is a great question though. So yeah but uh, again it might not be an iteration it might be a dot like for example M MD4 and MD5 MD5 was an iteration over MD4 but SHA2 and SHA3 might be totally different algorithms. Mm. Isn't the debugger the buggy anti-error scheme today? Oh, uh, 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 sorry, that's a, that's a 
Come on, yeah, today's topic is going to be the nanomice, aka debugger, debuggy, anti uh, reverse engineering scheme. Uh, we did change the title of the video quite late after I already launched the stream, so you might not see the changes yet. Do you think reading a general book about operating systems is a must before reading Windows uh, internals? It does help, and then, because thanks to it, you do recognize the parts of a system which they are being described in the Windows internals. I did read a general book about uh, algorithms used in, you know, scheduling algorithms and so on, um, spooling algorithms used in an operating system before I read Windows internals. So it's, it's a good idea. It will help. Okay. Um, yeah, it's 16 past, so I guess we can we can get going with with today's topic. I'm wondering if I have something interesting else to tell you. Yeah. Well, maybe one thing. I, I was playing on my vacation a little with electronics again, and I, for example, like this DDR2 RAM dice lost its EEPROM chip. I, I actually like soldered it out. Uh, here, here it is. Here it was. So, and I'm I have it soldered on one of my boards, and I have quite a lot of other hardware lying around here. Uh, I was trying to figure out like a couple of things, but um, if let me know in the comments or actually on the chat if you're interested in some more hardware uh, live streams as well. I am terrible at hardware. I am a beginner. I am a noob at hardware, and and I'm like not trying to be modest here. I seriously am. Um, but sometimes I figure out something cool, so I might share it with, you know, the obvious disclaimer that everything that you hear from me is, might be like total, totally not true, because I might be mistaken. It's, but yeah, if you're into it, I might, um, actually do it. For example, one of the ideas I had is, uh, how do the RGB RAM dices work? So, you know, there are like RAM dices with, her, which has color, color for lightning. I, I have some in my CPU. And how and you can change them from the, like the color from the operating system. How does it work? How does it communicate um, on the low level? And there are actually a couple of interesting things there which I didn't know about and learned after the soldering the EEPROM from it. So we could do a stream about that if you're interested. Mm. Okay. Mm. Uh, two more quick questions. What do you think about the fact that AMD will ship 32 cores for desktop PCs? I did see that. That's cool. I like it. I like a lot of cores. So yeah, that's cool. If it works, then yeah. Is it true that uh, there is a Windows kernel and uh, Windows executives? I'm not really sure what what would be Windows execut executives. So I don't I don't know. Can you tell me something about your day job? I'm a tech lead slash manager at Google and I'm leading a team called RIP, which is focusing on looking for vulnerabilities in internal systems, basically. So I look for vulnerabilities in internal systems and manage folks. That's basically it. Okay, um, really, let's start today's topic. Okay, Shaku is back. So uh, if you have any questions from now on, do message my moderator, who is Shaku. And I can even show you his website. That would be devshaku.cc, as usual. Uh, and he totally needs to put on a new blog post. Cool. So I'm wondering... Uh, oh, wait, I have a link for you, actually. Uh, because guest made another form with questions for you so you can test yourself and I'm going to give you a link on the chats and best of luck and we are going to um, I'm going to basically show you the answers at the, at the end of the stream I did give you links on the chats to the uh, to, to the form form like it's more like test questions so you can test yourself before the live stream and then maybe take it again after the live stream because why not um, yeah, I actually know the questions today because I did uh, modify them a little bit. And nonetheless, thank you guys for, for making the test as, uh, as usual. It's a pop quiz, I think, formally, right? I guess after, if you heard the intro, you can answer most of the questions. Now, I do need a, mm -hmm, a directory. 
I'm wondering if we should do it for Windows or for Linux. You know what, let's do it for Linux. And I might be struggling a little bit more because I know the Windows debugger API better than the Linux debugger API. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, I'm kinda confident it will actually work out. Or you can laugh at me that I, I fail miserably. So, um, okay, again, the idea. So the idea is that you have um, one process and you start the process and the process is being somehow, it's somehow detecting that you are starting it as the first process. For example, like there's a missing argument, a missing environment variable or whatever. This process um, sets that environment variable, that flag, let's call it a flag, and launches another process. So it launches a child process, right? So this is going to be the child process. Now, the parent process is, is basically, you can think of it, usually it's the same executable being spawned twice, but it doesn't have to be, but it can be. Yeah, um, there is no rule here. The first process is basically a debugger for the second process. So this is debugging this. This basically means that in any interesting event, for example, a crash, well, what is a crash on Linux? It would be a signal and, and some signals or um, in some other events, the debugger, the, the child is being stopped. Um, so yeah, this is being stopped, not killed, just stopped, like execution freezes. And the debugger, the main process is being notified that, hey, the, the child, like it threw an exception, like it um, risen a signal or whatever you want to, uh, however you want to think about it. Then the debugger can do something about it and it can for example, modify some registers, read some registers, and continue the execution of the child process. And the idea behind nanomites is basically that there's usually small instructions which cause a signal of some kind, an event of some kind. Um, it could be anything. It could be, for example, um, yeah, uh, let's, let's note it down. It could be int3, which is a software breakpoint. So it actually generates the third interrupt right but it's passed to the to the parent it could be almost any other interrupt which you can generate like for example division by zero because why not this is also a signal which will crush the child process which will actually make deliver an, uh, an event into the parent it could be ud2 which is um, the official the defined undefined instruction which is quite funny is the instruction which generates the undefined instruction fault, but it's actually documented that it's an instruction which is supposed to generate that, uh, that interrupt. So that's, yeah, that's the defined undefined instruction, I don't know. Then actually like any access to memory which is uh, not addressable for some reason, it's a non-canonical address on 64 bits, or for example, the memory is not mapped or you don't have right access to that part of memory, and well, whatever that actually causes a crash, right? Then again, the parent will be notified and this can act as a, as a nanomite. And um, yeah. You can even go a little further and call some APIs, uh, that's may maybe more, more true on Windows, that cause an exception, or like raise exception APIs on Windows, or like close handle, for example, in some cases also raises an exception. So you can call an API which does that for you. Uh, that's a little more annoying, because usually after a nanomite, um, you know, notifies the parent that the event happened, the parent wants to emulate an instruction. So the idea is to think about it that um, you insert these instructions into the child, so some code executes and then suddenly this instruction, like UD2, for example, right? And the idea is that you are thinking about UD2, for example, as uh, addition. It's not addition, but you are thinking about it as addition, you are using it as addition, like for example, you're thinking UD2 for me is going to be add EIX to EDX and place the result in ECX, because why not? And, um, and then you use the results later on. So what happens really is that the UD2 will throw an exception, um, it will raise a signal, whatever, and the parent will be notified and this process will be halted. The parent sees, oh, it's UD2, it's on this address, so I need to emulate adding EAX to EDX and placing the 
result for uh, an ECX. Therefore, it fetches the registers from the child and then it um, well, does the addition and then it modifies, modifies the registers and places them in the child and it continues the execution of the, of the child process. So the result, the real result as seeable from the child process is that UD2 actually added two numbers. Yeah. Oh, a lot of time passed for adding these numbers because this is slow. You know, you need to stop one process, switch to another process, it needs to execute, it might be quite slow, it needs to fetch, fetch some registers and so on, it needs to place some registers and then um, it needs to continue the execution and there needs to be another context switch for the child process. So it takes time. It's not a fast technique. Each of these instructions used as nanomite will be slow, but that's okay. Um, because this isn't about speed, this is about making reverse engineering harder. And why does it make reverse engineering harder? Well, if you look at this code, right, like in IDA or something, you see something, something, UD2, something, something, and you're like, hmm, UD2, that's throwing um, an undefined instruction CPU fault. What is it doing here? What is it supposed to do? And um, from the context which you have while looking only at the child process, you will be like, you will never guess that it, it's adding two registers together, for example. Uh, well, you might guess that from the context that there is something placed in one register, something in the other, and, um, and, and the result is going to place it in another register because it's obvious from the code that these registers are being prepared and the result is being read from another register. But yeah, well, what does it exactly do? You don't know. Why you don't know? Because that code is in the parent and you're not looking at the parent yet. So the way you do it usually is you need to reverse engineer both the parent code and the child code. So in the parent code, you look at the debugger loop, you look what is implemented there and how what changes does it make. And you need to, you know, read through the child code to actually to actually understand the program and how the logic is being used. Now, there is one more annoying thing here, which is actually great for anti-reverse engineering. And that is, in the, the child, you cannot attach a debugger to the child because, well, it already has a, a debugger attached to the parent, right? And that means that, um, well, operating systems actually allow only one debugger to be attached. If you look at the kernel implementation, there is no mechanism, no no mechanics, no schemes at all to actually allow another debugger to be attached. There can be only one debugger at a time, which means that, hey, if the child process is being already debugged by this process, then you cannot connect to with GDB or like some other debugger. This is true to some limit, of course, because not all debuggers actually require um, using the debugger API. There are silent debuggers which don't use it, but uh, they are not really not popular. So that's one thing. The other thing, if you use a kernel debugger, yeah, you can, on kernel level, you can attach to any process because you're not really attaching to a process. You're just reading information about the process from the kernel um, itself, which which puts you on a uh, above the kernel, which means, well, kind of above the kernel. But that means that uh, this doesn't stop you from debugging the process. If you would be using a hypervisor level debugger, that's also true. If you'd be, if you'd actually like somehow make the parent process not attached to the child and attach your debugger, then you can debug it, but you do have to emulate all the nanomites which are being used in the target. Now, um, one more thing is that there, there are like, because what I've described is a general scheme, right? And there are different ways you can, you can use it. For example, the article, which is one of the first articles on code project about nanomites well, that you can Google out, they are using replacing all the jump instructions, and including conditional jumps, with, um, with nanomites. And when a signal comes, then the jump table of targets is actually in the parent. And yeah, given that the... Um, yeah, given that the uh, the parent has to emulate the jump, of course. 
and the jumps are not in the child, which makes, uh, I guess, reading the code really, really terrible. Because Ida will like display just one huge block of code, and, and rightfully so. So yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Another way is to yeah, just put parts of the code in the parent and use the nanomites as syscalls into the parent. That's also something which, uh, which is a popular technique. Yeah, so that's it. Let's try to implement it, I guess. Um, let me check if there are any, any questions at this point. Oh, there are. I get lost. What are we trying to do? I guess I already answered that quite verbosely. But what, what we are going, what I will be trying to code is two processes where one process is debugging the other process. Is it true there is a Windows uh, kernel ex Windows executive? I did look at that. Do you think reading a general book? Okay, I answered that already. Mm. Okay. I mean what uh, about the Windows kernel and executive? I mean what Windows kernel consists of a smart pol uh, smart sorry small part, uh, for example, syscalls and synchronization. Other parts like I/O memory operations are part of what it's called uh, the executive. Mm. Yeah, that's still part of a kernel, I would argue. I mean, usually if you think about the kernel, you think about everything that is in user mode. Sometimes you even like pull the drivers into the same bag world kernel. So it depends on what, what you're exactly discussing. If you're discussing parts of the kernel, then yeah, it's totally split into multiple parts. Like, I know, like, uh, well, what you mentioned, for example, the, the scheduler, not to, uh, not to look too deep into it. So, so that's true. What's the difference between pragma ones and if not defined in H files? I don't think there's a difference. Pragma ones was implemented by one of the compilers and then it, I, I think it made its way into the standard. I'm not sure about it. I'm not sure pragma ones is in the standard, but it's implemented in all the modern compilers anyway. And it's shorter to write. Why is using virtual machines to obfuscate code wrong in the quiz? Uh, in the quiz, because it, uh, the question is about anti-dumping and not about uh, reverse anti-reverse engineering in general. So it's a subtle question. It, it actually guess originally had it for set to uh, true. I I disagree. Can you explain a bit how to solve bit flip crypto CTF? Um, Bit flip crypto CTF. Probably no. I which which task was it? I'm not I'm not sure. I'm not sure I didn't solve the task, that's for sure, so so I'm I'm probably cannot. Sorry. Okay, uh yeah, I'm still wondering if we should do it for Windows or for Linux. I think we should do it for for Linux, I said I will be struggling more for Windows, it will be easier. <laughs> yeah, let's do it for Windows. Because why not? Yeah, I don't know. What do, you, what do you folks think on chat? Do you prefer Windows or Linux? Let's do it this way. I'm going to leave the decision for you. FreeBSD. No, not FreeBSD. In all honesty, I used FreeBSD once or twice. Temple OS. I did exploit one thing for Temple OS on one of the CTFs, so that's about it. Linux, Windows, Windows, Windows. Let's learn something new on Linux. Okay, so two on Windows, four on Linux. Redox OS, <laughs> okay. Um, then, okay, so I think Windows is winning. Okay, let's do it like this, um, because I think it's like pretty equal. Windows 95. Uh, well, <laughs> okay, yeah, it's pretty equal. So let's do it like this. I'm going to do it for Windows today for Linux next week. So we have it covered on both fronts. And uh, next week it will be probably, hopefully a short stream in that case. 
Okay, so hmm, nano.c, c, let's code it in C. BIOS. That is a name I haven't heard in a long time. Hmm. Okay, uh, so what do we do? Let's start with spawning a new process. So again, we need to first detect whether a process is being executed and second as the first process and second spawn in that case a new process which is um, yeah which knows that it's being the second process and that's going to be debugged. So the, again, the first process is the bugger, the second is the buggy, and to do that, I guess I'm going to just do get env um, because why not? It it doesn't really matter. Uh, I think that's it. If get and um, you are the second. If it's equal to null pointer, that means the environment variable is not there. Uh, then we we go into the debugger um, branch, else we go into the the buggy branch, which is, you know, the child process, actually. So that's it. Uh, now the debugger branch, and we should probably, let, let's do just two files for this. Good. Hmm. Because otherwise the code will be rather terrible, so. This is, I don't know, is it the first time ever I'm using separate files on the live stream? <laughs> Probably no. Okay, so this is it. Okay, the buggy and the buggy.cc. Okay, here we go. Uh, da, 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 S the S T D D uh, acronym. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I made a typo when fixing a typo. Perfect. So pragma ones. There was a question about it. I do prefer pragma ones than the long free line stuff that was used in the past. Then, yeah, I don't need this here after all. I will need it here. And the debugger, I will not need it in the buggy. I will need it in the debugger. I probably don't need it here. I do need it here. So here, I'm not going to include debugger.h because it's not really needed. I am going to define this function though. Let's do it maybe like this. Uh, int and like void. Oh, right, it's C++, so this is enough. Okay, and okay, and here has to actually return, and return, and this is fine. Cool, now the buggy, we, it's also going to return an int. Now yeah, it's a rather short h file, the bugger, the buggy, fine. Hmm. Okay, and I guess we. I'm just going to copy these. I'm not sure what the debuggy is going to do yet, but we will figure that out. So, return zero, and here. Let's, for the time being, put. Oh, that's not helpful. Yeah, let's for the time being use, hmm, just print something out, but to make sure that we this mechanism work and that we'll iterate on it. The buggy, okay. There's just one letter of difference in these words, so that's why I'll add, add child here. So this is fine, this is fine. Now we actually need to 
create, well, starting the child process here, and that's being done with create process on Windows. And I need to use create process instead of anything else because I need to tell it that it's going to be debugged and create process is the, well, the perfect way to do it. You can actually put a flag there. So um, create process is uh, one of the wonderful Windows APIs, which has uh, 2,700 parameters, or actually, well, this many. Most of it is not really super interesting. Now, um, yeah, the application name or the command line, this is going to be a hard one because, well, I know it's going to be called nano exe, but I actually need dynamically to figure that out. Like, was, hey, what's the name of the process? What is the place where the executable is in? So I will need to figure that out before I even call it. Then there is a creation flag, which I mentioned, which is like the bug. Or is it here? Process creation flags, the back. Yeah. The back process. This is what we are going to to basically have to include in the flags. And uh, yeah, then for the environment variable, I can I'm not going to use the LP environment variable, I'm going to set it to null and I'm going in the debugger here set env. Use the set env to, to set that environment variable. So yeah, let's do it like this. Now the name of this was okay. Uh, yeah, let's just set it to one. That doesn't matter what it's being set to as long as it, it is actually set. Now the idea here is that all the child processes do inherit the environment variables. So mm, yeah, that's uh, that's why I am putting it here. Now for the time being, I'm not going to bother with actually dynamically getting the application name and the command line. We can do it in a second. For now, let's just call create process nano exe. Nano, that's by the way the editor in Linux, right? Okay, let's move it like this. Then the command line is actually, if I, so it's kind of funny, I, I'm pretty sure I can omit this. Hmm. Command line if is null. Can I put null here? Can be null in this case. The function uses the string pointed to as the command line. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I don't. I don't want to pass any arguments to it, so I'm totally fine with it. Then the process attributes is something which um, oh, these are the security attributes. I'm not going to limit access to the process in any way. If I would be doing, you know, real anti-reverse engineering, I probably would set up some security descriptors which would limit access to these threads to, well, probably only, uh, only this process, and so that no other process can actually open my process, even if it should have the right. Uh, you know, privileges to do it. That being said, it's a super weak protection because uh, any process running with, you know, admin or the same user can actually switch the um, security ACLs of uh, of another process which it has access to. So, yeah, that doesn't matter. Cool. Uh, so, but I'm just going with no. I'm not setting any security descriptors here. Then uh, inherit handles. Uh, no, I don't want it to inherit any handles. I don't care about handles. I want it to in inherit the environment variable, but not the handles. Then we have the creation flags, which I mentioned. And um, so let's go to the creation flags again. Ooh, is there anything interesting here? Like new console, new process group, no window, protected process. Um, yeah, like you might want to look actually through these flags if you're writing anti-reverse engineering stuff. I'm just going to go with uh, sus with the back process. I'm pretty sure it's being suspended regardless of whether I do the create suspended flag. It's, create suspended is pretty useful, by the way, if you want to do some funky stuff with the child process, but I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to mm, go with this. The calling thread starts and debugs the new process and uh, all child processes created by the new process. Yeah, and this is the API we are going to use to receive the debugger events. So this is basically the API which is used for, um, yeah, which is used for by the debuggers, right? If you create a debugger on Windows, uh, you know, a user level debugger, then you need to use that API. Is there anything else? No, I don't think there's anything else. So I'm just going to grab this. Then there's the environment. And again, the environment, I'm going to do null. And null in this case means just inherit all the environment from the parent. 
current uh, directory, do I have to put it? I'm pretty sure it can be null, and in this case, it will be the same current work directory as the parent. Then startup info, and startup info is something I will have to create. So, um, yeah, so I will have to create this info. And there's also another one called process info, I believe, which I will also have to create and set up. So, yeah. The process information, uh, I, I don't actually have to set it up too much because that's um, just the handles which I'm getting back. That's actually what, uh, what I'm getting back. Why, why doesn't it? Why isn't there a link to the type at the beginning? Yeah, here we go. Yeah, you just get the, you know, like stuff like handles to the thread, to the main thread of a created child, to the process uh, and uh, the IDs, the PID and the TID for the thread or thread ID. So this I do not have to set up, I just have to create it. Uh, P. This is usually the way I call it. Now, SI, let's just initialize it with zeros. And I do need to set up the size of the structure, if I can remember correctly. Yeah, the CB here is actually the size of the structure, and you need to initialize it because thanks to it, the create process API knows which version of the structure you're using because there are several uh, versions of the structure, by the way. So this is size of SI. And I'm not setting any flags here. Like, all this is, I'm not, I don't care. I want it to be the same. So this is fine. I guess I could. Yeah, I could do it in one line, but uh, let's just go with this. And here I need to pass the, this, and I think that's about it for the process creation. Yeah, that's it. That being said, it does return the value, so let's grab the returned value. And let's do it like printf. Um, red is equal to red. Now, um, a bool in Windows is actually and yeah, it's an integer because of reasons, so this is fine. And then I'm going to close handle on both of them. This is something which needs to be to happen at the end of the process. It doesn't need to happen really. When I exit, it will be closed anyway. The handles will be closed. But for the time being, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do a get char just to see if it works. And that's it. Now it will... I'm going to put zero here just to see if the child thread is executed because if I would leave this here, the child... sorry, the child process is executed because if I would leave it, it would be in a halted state because there is an event sent to the debugger, hey, a new process is being created, I think, and I'm pretty sure a new thread is being created. So, uh, and because we don't have the debugger loop yet, which receives the events, then we cannot really uh, we cannot really continue the execution and then we would not see the test message. Okay, um, so that's it. Now I'm going to compile it. Here we go. I have, uh, oops, that's not what I wanted. Yeah, I have newest, well, semi-newest MINGF GCC here, so this should be fine. Nano.cc, debugger.cc, and debuggy.cc, wall extra. Okay, debugger was not, uh, that's fine. Oh, nano exam, okay. Now, um, debugger was not declared, but I'm. Okay, maybe I forgot to save the file. Okay, I forgot to save the file. Set end was not, what? It wasn't really? Why? Uh, sorry, in the debugger. Here we go. Set on. I'm pretty sure that's a real API. It's in, well, on Windows. Where is it on Windows? MSDN. Put env. Really? Really? And string. That's interesting. Okay, well, whatever. Yeah, okay, and let's see if it works. Okay, it it does work. Here is the message from the parent. Here is the return value, which is true. 
and here is the child which has started. Now it's actually waiting for me to press enter. And I'm not sure if the child is still running. In this case, let's uh, let's uh, do task list and grab it with uh, nano. Now it's not running, so it was killed when the parent actually exited. Be Why was it killed? That's weird. Oh right, <laughs> no, it wasn't killed. It just exited before the parent. Uh, it exited because it yeah doesn't wait, so that's fine. Okay, that's fine. Then we can continue with this, and as I told you now, it's not going to actually display the message. So I run nano, it's not displaying the message because the process is halted, so if I exit, I'm pretty sure that when the debugger exits, the child is automatically killed unless the debugger uses uh, detach API to detach itself from the debuggy. Which means that, uh, yeah, again, the child should be dead. There should be no... Yeah, it's not here. Perfect. Mm. So, now we can continue. We can create the, the loop, right? We don't need the sprint. I know it works already. And we can create the debugger loop, which we will do as soon as I find the documentation for this API. It's actually... Mm, yeah, it's like, it's not hard or anything. So we need the bug event, and the bug event is actually quite a large structure, if I remember correctly. I'm going to close this. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a really nice scheme of, well, nice, it's a typical C scheme of um, a structure with several unions and depending on what the debug event code is one of these unions is being filled so for example when the process is created you get this event and the information you will read from this field but then if um, I don't know something tries to load a DLL then you get this information or if an exception happened which we will use a lot today in the debuggy then you read information from this field so yeah that's pretty uh, pretty simple let's call it um, I don't know, event, or just EV. I don't think I have to initialize it in any way, so I'm not going to. And now we do have to wait for the event to happen. So we do red, um, yeah, like, I'm, I'm reusing a, a variable, I'm not happy with that, but okay, whatever. So I'm going to make the window a little bit smaller, maybe this window as well. Okay, and we pass it the event, and then we pass it how long should it wait for the event, and we actually uh, wait for an infinity, but we are fine with waiting for infinity. Now, um, if a function fails, a zero is returned, otherwise a non-zero, well, it's a bool, so that means probably true. Therefore, uh, we can do it in the loop, by the way, so... Yeah, like, just an infinite loop, that's fine. Okay, now if the function failed for some reason, so if not red, we can, uh, I don't know, we can say like, failed, and get last error, and return, because why not, return one. Okay, otherwise we do have some event to process, so what we can do is we can just print the event for the time being, uh, which we will do. So, event, and the field name in the event is the back event code. TV, here we go. And let's see what's happening now. Oh, by the way, uh, we need to continue the execution, which we do by calling continue the back event, that's it. Okay, enables the debugger to continue a thread that previously reported the debugging event. This is exactly what we need to do. And we need to pass it the process ID, the thread ID, and the continuous status. So the process ID in our case is we're going to read them from the PI, right? Because the process information uh, does have this information. So if we switch here, it's in the process. Oh, wait. Um, but no, uh, no, 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 no. We, we should use actually the event. Uh, because... As the debugger, we are getting events for the children as well. So if a child would create another process, then 
or another thread, then we would get, you know, different IDs here. And yeah, it would just not work because we would be continuing the wrong one. So we can, we can, we need to use these fields from the event, like uh, to continue the actual thread and actual process which did send the event to us. And we need another, um, a continuation status. Now the status, there are a couple of them. Um, continue, the exception not handled, and reply later. I don't know what reply later is. It's supported in Windows and I don't know. I seriously don't know. I never seen this before. Continue means, um, yeah, pretend the error never happened and continue the execution. Now, um, yeah, exception not handled means that the, the, the exception handling mechanisms in the child needs to be started and they need to, to run. Otherwise, if an exception happens, then the exception handling in the child never sees it. Uh, which, which means we are using this, the back continue. Now, this is a little heavy handed, I would say, but we are always doing continue. But um, we should do continue only in cases where we are sure that we handled the exception. But for now, we're just writing the loop and that's, uh, that's about it. Cool, let's compile it. Uh, and but has the word, that's fine. And that's also fine. Yeah, we can do you. You is more compatible with the word because the word is actually unsigned and you is also unsigned. Uh, it doesn't know that the word is unsigned and but it actually is. I think it's either that or unsigned long, but doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to. Um, Add this like, yeah, maybe that's here, I guess. Who no format? Yeah, so it doesn't complain about the formats. I'm pretty sure I'm getting my formats right until I get it wrong, obviously. And now we can run it. Yeah, so as you can see, there were the debugger started when there were several events, like debugger events, right? We are going to see what events exactly in a second, and then the child. Well, actually executed, and then some more events, and that's it. And it's still waiting. It sh it should exit at this event because this event is probably exit like child exited, but it didn't. Let's see. Maybe because we don't have it supported, we'll support it in a second. Cool. So um, we need to oh, let's just leave it here. We need to check the numbers. Oh, I'm totally didn't want to do that. Let's let's see what. We have three at the beginning. Three is create process debug event. Um, yeah, which means um, a new process has been started, which being is being handled by the debugger. Mm, sorry. Uh, this is obviously called for every child which is being debugged by this debugger if a new child is created, but even for the first child is being called. Then we have six. What is six? Six is load DLL debug event, which means like, yeah, there are a lot of DLLs being loaded. It's quite nice of the operating system to actually have this. This is a pretty high level debug code versus all the other, uh, so, yeah, versus all the other codes, but it's it's actually cool that it, it's there. Then we have two. Now, what is two? Uh, two is thread is being created. So as you can see, the um, the DLLs are being loaded even before a thread is created. I don't think that's actually true, by the way. Um, but I'm pretty sure the event for a thread has been created is being called from user mode. So it's being called rather late after a thread is already created for the first thread, not sure about the other threads. Uh, I might be mistaken here, but that's my intuition. And after the thread is created and our DLL is being loaded, we could actually read which DLLs are being loaded, but let's skip it. Then uh, one is uh, mm, exception deba debug event where some, some debug event is being, something is happening, something is crashing. And uh, yeah, it might be something in the startup code which is being handled gracefully by the child. That's uh, possible. And then the code is actually executed. And then we have three and four, which is uh, exit thread and exit process. So 
we don't care about most of these events, by the way. Let's do like this. We're going to... Okay, no, okay. this is not very log. This is uh, C++. So let's do a switch case on this. This is the normal way you do it, by the way. And you do... Uh, on default, you're going to still print it. Let's do a break. This break is kind of redundant, but let's leave it. It's, uh, I guess, good coding. Why are you never using CL from Visual Studio? Because CL uh, takes a couple of seconds to launch and Sublime takes 0.1 seconds to launch. This is the sole reason. I like my uh, editors to launch instantly and not wait for them. Uh, that being said, it's not fully true. I sometimes do use uh, this. Oh, sorry, but you're not asking about Visual Studio per se, you're asking about CL. Uh, I guess that's only because I'm more familiar with uh, command line for G++ and GCC. And another thing is that switching to CL takes some time because it takes a couple of seconds to initialize the environment, so I don't want to do it. I don't have it done by default. But that's, uh, these are the only reasons. I mean, CL is a great compiler. I sometimes do use it when I'm testing code and I want to compile something with several compilers, I do use it. I do use it when sometimes writing stuff for Windows as well, so it's not like I'm not using it. I'm sometimes am. And I do have it installed. But I prefer Minc on even on Windows, which isn't always the greatest choice in all honesty. CL is a little better. I do have Clang as well. Mm. But Clank on Windows is, yeah, it it has some issues which I didn't solve yet. It's not that there is a problem with a compiler, it's more like an issue with my environment. Okay, so uh, what do we care about? We care about exit process, like case this, and here we just break. Yeah, uh, that's it. We can, I guess we can continue it. I'm not sure if it really does anything anymore, like continuing. Let's assume it does, and then we break. Now, the break here is supposed to be a break from this, but uh, that's not... Yeah, one of the things I'm missing in C++ is actually breaks with labels. So I could label this for, like ASDF, and do break ASDF, but you cannot do it in C++. There are some languages where you can, by the way. I'm not sure if in Java you cannot do something like that. Uh, that means we're adding a flag. So bool vnt equals false, uh, not python. While not the end, run this code, and here we say uh, the end is true, and we do the break, which means we will go here. This will be executed. I'm seriously not sure whether I need to execute it, but I don't care too much. You can, I leave it as an exercise to the viewers to check it. And uh, then this will execute and it will leave a loop, which is fine. So this is the event we care about. Now, the events which we don't care about, but we also don't want to get spammed with them, is this one. Then three, which was uh, create process and create thread as well. This one we do not care about, and this one we do not care about either. Uh, that being said, this isn't fully true because we probably should close handles and we are unless we are using them. But we have only one thread. I'm going to abuse the fact that we have only one thread. Otherwise, the thing is that when this event happens, that a new thread has been created, we get a handle to that thread. So if we look at the create thread debug info, you get a handle to it. And given that you get a handle to it, it means that um, First of all, the handle is opened and you should close it. Second of all, uh, you should use that handle when requesting um, requesting registers related to that thread, because you know each thread has a, their own separate uh, set of registers. So maybe, maybe we should actually handle that. So maybe I'm going to handle this. I'm going to make a map of threads for myself. Uh, let's see about the created process. I'm pretty sure we are getting the handle as well. Wow, quite a lot of handles actually. So I'm just going, okay. I wanted to do like case, case, case break, but I think I need to add at least some minor support here. I'm going to close the handles. Close the handle is in the EV. 
now in the EV it's called um, u dot create thread create process so process I'm going for process okay and now file yeah. I already have a handle for the process open I do not need this handle and for the thread is it the main thread initial thread yeah I also have I also have uh, the initial threads handle already, so I'm going to close this handle. Then for the thread stuff, I'm going to... I'm not going to close the handle, I'm going to make a map of... Um, yeah, an ordered map, actually. Okay, and I'm going to create an unordered map of... Uh, of what? Of thread ID to, so uh, that's a B word, into a handle. A handle is basically void pointer, or you can think of it as a, as a number. That, that's fine as well. It's a number which ha makes sense in kernel mode and doesn't make sense in, in user mode, like an index into an array and so on. Uh, threads. Okay, so ooh, I totally don't remember how you use it. I think you use it like this. So threads. Uh, Threads. Oh, but in this case, I should actually close the. Since I'm using this, I should close the thread handle early after creating it because I'm getting the handle later anyway. It's not the same handle, I'm pretty sure it's not the same handle. Okay, so I'm creating, then I'm closing the handle, then I'm going here. And in case a thread is created, then I use the thread's uh, information. It's not the thread process though. It's, sorry, not create process, it's create thread. Why is it create process info and create thread without info? Yeah, I don't know, but okay, whatever. Create thread and I want to grab... Why do not why don't I have a thread ID? Oh, uh, I do not need the thread ID here because I get the thread ID from the event. So, yeah, no, I'm sorry. So that would be event and thread ID. Okay. And I get create thread. Okay. So I'm getting the handle for that specific thread here. And I'm storing it. Then when the thread closes, or here I actually don't care. I hope I don't care. I might be leaking some handles, I don't I don't know. But okay. Then when the thread is exiting, so I do need to handle the thread exit event. So exit thread. Okay, so okay. Then I do need to remove it. And I have totally no idea how to remove something from a map. C++ reference map remove. That's what you get for like switching between languages, so... Okay, yeah, I can just use erase. So thread erase, thread this. Erase, and I just grab this. Break. But being said, before I do, the, do that, I need to check a couple of more things. First of all, I need to check whether I get another handle to that thread for some reason which is somewhat possible, but I don't. I just get the exit code, that's fine. I do not care about the exit code. I do need to call close handle on uh, threads for this. Okay, so now I'm not leaking any handles and let's see if it still works. A close handle was not defined, that's pretty, <laughs> yeah, pretty probable. Okay, yeah, it works. I'm still getting the... Oh, sometimes I get 7. What is 7? Why didn't I get 7 here? Oh, that's weird. 7 is unload the back event. Okay, I totally don't care about it. So, um... I wonder what kind... 
which software in my operating system does something funny with DLLs. That's pretty usual, but when you install software, then it turns out that the software likes to inject DLLs into your process for some reason. There are like official ways to do it in Windows. And I, for example, have a blog post on my post when I wanted to launch StarCraft 2 and it didn't want to launch. And after debugging, it turned out that my vacuum uh, drivers for a tablet, for a graphical tablet, were injecting a DLL and the DLL was freezing at initialization and therefore StarCraft didn't want to launch for some reason. So yeah, that's just crazy. But the more stuff you install, the more DLLs you have in your process, even if you don't actually import them. Cool. Uh, so it works. Now one. What is one? Exception. This is something, this is, I, I guess, the most important part of it. So case, exception. Now. Okay. And this is where all the fun is actually going to take place, and I am going to create a new function for this. So handle exception. Because it might be an anonymite. Um, and what I'm going to pass it here is I'm going to pass the event. Then I'm going to pass the process handle, I guess, which I'm not closing, right? So that will... Do I need the process handle, by the way? I don't, I'm not sure if I need the process handle. What's the... What was the debug API for getting the registers? <laughs> MSDN debugger get registers API. Creating a custom, okay, that's fine. I, don't, I honestly don't remember the name of the API. Hmm. State evaluation, that's it. Program control, yeah, that's it. Uh, but that's not very correct. Oh, debugging, yeah, this is the correct API which I'm using. I get first context. Yeah, this is this is the one. I just need the I don't need the process handle, I just need the thread handle, which is fine. So I give it the event. I give it I do I need to yeah I can give it the, the full event. Then I need to give it the handle, which is going to happen like this. And do I need to give it anything else? I don't think I need to. So I'm going to skip it. Uh, for the time being, I hope there is no API called handle exception. Static, I don't care. IK void, and yeah, I get the debug information, so the debug event. Event and const. Yeah. That's the first argument, and the second argument is going to be the handle to the thread. Okay, cool. Okay, and now here's where the magic related to nanomites will happen, by the way. But to do that, we will need to... Um, let's, let's first of all determine what we want to do. So we need to add some logic to the debuggy in this case. And let's assume that we want... I, I gave you the example of adding two numbers at the beginning, right? So let's do just that. Let's add two numbers and I'm going to abuse the API a little due to reasons. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a function and the function is going to be called add two numbers, because why not? And I will want the function to be actually executed inside the, the parent, right? So. What I will do here is I will call it int3. Um, no, let's call it ud2, because ud2 is it's funnier. So let's call ud2, and that's it. And yeah, um, I'd prefer for this function to be a naked function. I'm pretty sure there are naked functions now in GCC, so let's try let's try that. Again, uh, veil naked. I know that's a weird query, I'm sorry. But yeah, there is this blog post and somebody here was uh, nice enough to tell me that there are naked functions in GCC. Uh, so, GCC naked functions. 
Okay, what's 2010? Oh. Attribute naked. Let's see if it actually works. Yeah, because I want this function to be naked. Naked means, dear compiler, please do not add any prologue, please do not add any epilogue, please only issue like the code which I write right here. So this should be fine. Mm. And I'm going to go with that. Now we are going to check in a second if it compiles correctly. Uh, yeah, and here I just, uh, I'm just going to do printf, um, like result. And I'm going to call add two numbers with some numbers, 120 and 222. So the result we are expecting is three, four, five. Let's see if what will happen. Well, it won't happen obviously right now, but it shouldn't crash either. It should actually. Uh, you know what? I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to do a flash here. Because uh, what I'm thinking about right now is um, I'm going. I'm doing continue right now, but there, I'm not sure whether continuing after UD2 will mean execute UD2 again or whether it will mean. Uh, execute the next construction after UD2. The logic is sometimes weird, so I want to be sure that the debuggy is actually exiting. Child exiting. Starting. And I need the flash here. Uh, well, I don't need the flash here. Actually, yeah, I don't need it. Actually, Windows will flash here after at the, the end of, uh, of puts, so that's fine. I think it's going to flash. It flashes at printf, well, whatever, just in case. Let's compile it. Mm, okay, um, was not declare, handle exception, was not declare. Handle exception, why was it not declared? Uh, oh, well, it is here. What do you want? Is it about the types? Okay, I give it the event. Oh, uh, no, wait. But no, that's fine. And I give it the handle. This is returning the handle. Why is it complaining? Oh, because I didn't click save. Yeah, I didn't click save. A new parameter, that's good, that's good. A new parameter AB, that's also fine. Though, for in my case, I'm just going to do this. Okay. Wow, it doesn't issue an error about not returning a value from a naked function. That's actually amazing. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to show you what's the difference because there's a question about this on the chat. What's the difference between between a naked function and a non-naked function? So to do that, I need to do dash s dash mass equals intel here. So this generates, the dash s generates an assembly file. It doesn't compile, it just generates an assembly file. And we get debugger debuggy assembly file. Here we go. And this is the naked function, or wasn't it? Why, why do I have printf here? I don't know, whatever. This is the naked function. It starts here. Well, yeah, okay, it starts here, whatever. Then um, the code, I'm going to highlight all the assembly instructions. It's UD2, that's it. Yeah, this here is actually, this is weird. Oh, it doesn't have a return. We're going to need to add a return. But as you can see, there is no prologue, there is no epilog here, right? So we need to add a return, actually. Right. They're like assembly level return. Here we go. And uh, please reload the code. Oh, okay. Okay. Let's go over again. Yeah, now it's uh, UD2 and then return. That's fine. And uh, this uh, this is just added by the compiler for safety, so that the code never reaches it. Um, and UD2 would be would supposed to crash it to let the programmer know, hey, your code didn't return. But yeah, as you can see, the whole function is only the instructions which I've written here. Now, if I remove the naked, that's not going to be the case. So removing, recompiling. As you can see, there is a warning, but there is no return statement, which is a correct warning. Now it, uh, yeah, and now it reloaded itself. And the function has some more code. There is this code here, there is this code. 
there is uh, this code at the end as well. And I don't want this code to be here because I want this function to be more like a syscall into the parent, like a nanomite, right? This nanomite and um, I don't want it to have any addition, uh, additional assembly code because I'm going to rely on the calling convention. So I want the function to be only restricted to the assembly code I've written here. So basically naked means this function is going to be an assembly, like you rewrite the function assembly, that's it. Which I hope uh, it's, it's obvious now. Okay, um, now we can run it. So let's go here. It's not going to work, but we can run it. Okay, so it's starting. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, it's it froze, uh, as as I said, uh, is yeah, it's frozen because as I expected, actually it's redoing UD two, and I don't want it to redo UD two. I want it to continue, but we will handle that in a second. Now. Um, what we need to do is we need to print some information about the, the third context because we need to discourage any event which is not related to actual our nanomites. So, uh, bool red equals get thread context. Thread context is basically the registers. And uh, the thread context mm, ctx the structure which I'm instantiating here I need to tell initialize it with a flag which tells me which tells the system of the kernel which registers do I care about because fetching all the registers might be a little long so to speed things up you might want only general purpose registers but not like the AVX 512 registers therefore um, let's go here and we need to look for the proper one yeah, this is basically, yeah, forever has been here, but yeah, do not look here, actually look on the context in your in your compiler's files. So this is exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to open the windows and t.h file. Here we go, and let's look for context. And we need the context structure for our exact architecture, which will be, well, 64-bit. Um, but these are by the way the flags that I'm going to use. I need control registers and I guess I'm going to need the integers as well. I do not care about the rest. I will just get uh, these ones. And now the context for... Mm, this is my context. Yeah, this looks like my context. It's like 64-bit registers, so that's, that's fine. So this is the, which, uh, the thing I'm going to use, and I'm not sure what this like, p1 home, what's this, whatever. Context flags is the field I'm going to set, and I'm going to set it to these two. And again, the integers are going to be these registers, and the control registers is going to be rip and it's going to be e flags, at least if I'm not mistaken. So it's going to get the information from the child process, the child thread, which created this event. Uh, it's going to get the, the values of these registers and we're going to act upon them. Now, uh, handle and ctx, okay. Do I have a third? Is there a third in C? Okay, never ever use assert for error checking in production code. Because if you compile it with optimized option, then the asserts are going away. That's one of the ways to look for vulnerabilities. You look what checks are going away after compiling with, yeah, after removing asserts. But um, assert that return is true, that's fine. Okay, and now we have uh, we can print out, like for example, rip, because why not? So ctx rip, yeah. which is the instruction pointer, as you do know. 
Ooh, what was it? Like ZX? I always forget what's the proper formatting. I think ZX is fine. Would be fine. Oh, oh, oh wait, I can just use P. The type of it is, yeah, I know it's void pointer, so it's fine. CTX dot. Okay. Let's try now and let's see. I'm quite curious where is the other unused parm for was fine. Okay, assertion failed. Why did it fail? I'm going to make sure I'm using this correctly. Um, if every crashes, I get a, a debugger just in time debugger spawned. Zero. Yeah, uh, it fails for some reason. Why do you fail? Okay, uh, then I'm not going to assert it for the time being. Let's just. Okay. Why does it fail? Uh, well, <laughs> it's it's quite easy. It fails because of a reason, and uh, I, I should actually print that reason. Yeah. And yeah. Six windows uh, get last error codes. System error codes, and we have error number six. It's invalid handle. Why is the handle invalid? Handle is invalid because it's all zeros. Why is it all zeros? It's all zeros because the thread isn't there. That's pretty obvious. Why isn't the thread there? We did handle this, right? So. Okay, well, there are some threads, right, created, and I'm getting handles to all of them, which means that for some reason the thread event is weird. Okay. It's... Okay, that's a thread I didn't see before. Why isn't... Why is it different? So there are threads which are being created. I'm, you know what I'm going to actually... Oh, wait. It might be because of this. Mm, yeah, I think I know what's going on. But it's actually like the first thread is actually we don't get an event about the first thread for some reason. PI and... Uh... Sorry, what was the name again? Thread ID? Maybe the main thread, yeah, like the main thread has this. And we do not have the main thread if we do not get the event about the main thread being created, so we won't have it on the map. Now the main thread is here, but we are not getting... Yeah, it's the, it's, it is exactly the thread. So, yeah, this is the problem. So I'm not going to close this handle in the end here. I'm going to close it here. And I'm probably closing it two times, which isn't great. Which means that after creating this map, I have to do this equals pi uh, h thread. Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Okay. And now I have added it, and now it should be fine. So let's try. Okay, I get this, and I have this added, and this is uh, my return. What is this? It's rip? If this is rib, that's a really stupid rib. So I'm going to 
remove this, I'm going to remove this, and here, no, it's not rip. It's, oh, it's, uh, I don't know what is it. Is the handle? Yeah, it's the handle here. So we get the handle, so this is fine. I can remove this now. And yeah, this should work. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, perfect. Uh, this is a correct value then. Now I'm going to scroll a little bit up to see... Yeah, this is some DLL. Like 7FF is basically, it tells you it's some DLL, a system DLL probably. And our code is around this value. So I'm just going to ignore everything which is not in our code. That being said, I don't really know where our code is, but I'm going to assume there is no ASLR for our code and blah, blah, blah. But in all honesty, you should, when implementing Nanomice correctly, you should assume there is ASLR, uh, you know, address space randomization, so the address for the main binary might change, and you should use proper techniques like uh, actually enumerating the modules of a different uh, process to, um, to know where it is, right? Now, um, for me today, it's enough that the address in the rib will contain this. Uh, on these bytes. So what I'm going to do here, so I do not, I do not need this, I'm going to stick with the assert, here is that if this uh, with this mask, what mask I'm going to use, let me grab this, OX, and I'm masking in the bits which I care about, yeah I care about these bits and I do not care about these bits, So if this is equal to OX and uh, this needs to be zeroed, yeah. then it's fine. If it's not equal though, let's assume it's not equal, then just return. I, I'm not going to do anything else here, just continue the execution, but uh, it actually should continue the execution saying that the event was not um, handled by my code, but it seems to work, so I'm going to just skip it. Otherwise, we get the exception, so let's compile it. Okay, which is perfect. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fetch the, the opcode. What is the opcode of UD2? I do not know. I need to launch IDA to know that, so I'm going to launch IDA to know that. Okay, cool. So, um, debugger, debuggy, we go to, we call the function, add to numbers, and the function does ud2, which is ofob, so that's two bytes. ofob, okay. So, I want to fetch two bytes from that place where a rip is right now. To do that, I'm going to use another API, which is read process memory, which I think I do need the, the handle to the process right now for it. Yeah. Handle process, process handle, yeah, like this. And here, when I'm calling this function, I'm going to add pi dot h process, okay, which is the opened process handle, and thanks to it I can read memory of that process, so I'm going to do read process memory, which is the ph is the process handle, then the base address, the, by, the address where I'm actually, from which I'm going to read is the rib, then uh, the buffer which I'm reading into, so that's going to be a, like a, a byte, bytes is unsigned char, buffer 2, let's just do this, and so that's the buffer, then size is going to be 2, and I do need size t, how many bytes were actually read, uh, so, okay, and let's actually read. I'm, I guess I'm going to do this. 
going to assert that it actually worked. Cool. Now I have two bytes and I can compare whether these bytes are uh, the bytes which I'm looking for. So if byte is O X O F and buff of one is Oh, thank you for the donation, Walter. Um, what's that? That's a rocket, a camera, and moon. Okay, I thank you. Mm. And the second byte is OB. So now we know this is our nanomite, and the nanomite is supposed to add two numbers. Now, um, I made this function a naked function on purpose because that means that the the two arguments are going to be in the registers because that's the calling convention, right? If we look in IDA again, so here's IDA again. Uh, okay, if we look how it's called, you will notice that the numbers are going to be placed in the EDX and ECX registers. So um, I need to add these two numbers basically, which means I'm grabbing the first number from one register which is ctx dot r rdx, uh, yeah. And uh, I need only like the lower bits, or I can, I guess, do this, like the word, or int actually. Yeah, whatever. And I'm truncating on purpose because the function takes int, so I'm I need to get ints as well. And rcx is the second number. Now the result is obviously going to be uh, both of them, but the result is going to be have to be placed in the rax register because that's the place where all the return values are being uh, stored in this calling convention. So this is where we we do have to put the return value as well. And I'm also going to con like sorry truncate it to to 32 bits, regardless of what type it would be. But I need to truncate it. And uh, yeah, this might be undefined behavior of code, so let's do Sebastian, thank you for the donation. JSON versus RSS as feed. Uh, is JSON actually used as feed in some technology? I honestly remember RSS and I remember Atom and only these two. Is there some new feed technology which uses JSON? I mean, I do prefer JSON over XML almost every day, so yeah. Okay, this is better. Uh, yeah, sorry, this is basically because otherwise adding two numbers which might overflow would be an undefined behavior and I don't want an undefined behavior here. So I'm getting 64-bit values from the registers, I'm truncating them to 32-bit values and then expanding them into 64-bit values because when I add two 64-bit values, um, which were our derivatives from 32-bit values, I know that there will be no overflow uh, because that, mathemat that is mathematically impossible, obviously. So I add them, but then I need to truncate the result again into 32 bits, and then there's implicit cast here for uh, for the 64-bit D word again. And here, uh, yeah, here. No, wait, uh, yeah, this is incorrect, obviously. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is better. I guess a better way to do it actually would be to do. Yeah. This is basically the same thing, kinda, because this takes the sign into account and this doesn't. And I would like it to take the sign into account. I would like to do a sign extension. So now it's better. Now, if I have done this, I do need to flash the context, basically, as in send the context again, which I do with set thread context. And most of the context doesn't change, so yeah, just one letter change basically to do it. And that's it. Uh, no, that's not it. Because I do need to skip the... As you can see, rip here is always the same, and that's again because if UD2 is being called, then the EIP is not being progressed. Uh, which means I do need to progress it here. So ctx.rip plus 2 because UD2 has two bytes. Okay, compile run and that's it now um result is 
three, four, or five, which is correct. That's good. As you can see, once the code was called, so yeah, it basically worked. Our nanomite worked, which means that um, yeah, that, that's basically it. Now, this is just the basic code, obviously, and you you can expand it any way you like. If you want to do that trick where with replacing jumps with a call table, you can do that, and so on. Obviously, the more complicated the nanomite gets, the more probable is that you will require to have a an external script to do pre-processing for your code after it's generated. But um, yeah, for the most simple nanomite or the debugger debuggy scheme, this is this is the way to go. So again, to sum up, basically sum up what happens is that we have two processes actually being the same executable, but the first time that we run it, it actually executes a copy of itself with an environment variable set. And the copy runs the code, um, well, this code basically, where add to numbers is something which is not in the, um, well, not in this code, right? And ideally, you'd remove all the code which is related to the debugger from, from this executable. So um, if somebody looks on memory, they don't see any code related to the uh, to this, but that doesn't really, well, maybe that doesn't matter too much, because in the end, um, this uh, doesn't tell you too much, unless you have the symbols, if you have the symbols for something else, but this doesn't tell you too much. You do not have to, by the way, create functions like this for nanomites, you can just replace them in assembly, but since I wanted to do it from C++, I wanted to call a nanomite like a syscall from, uh, from C++, I did have to do it like this, and when this code is executed, an exception is being raised, and the kernel says, oh, this process which has risen the exception actually has a debugger, which means that ex the debugger gets first um, the information about it, uh, about the exception. And we get a debug event, which is an exception debug handle, uh, sorry, uh, exception debug event, which we handle in this function. We verify whether uh, our rip is currently in our program and whether the instruction which caused the crash, so the one which rip points to, is actually UD2. And if it is, then we emulate the whatever we think that nanomite should do, and we progress rip, so we don't get an indefinite loop. And we set the third context, and we continue, and that's, that's basically it. So, so yeah, that's about it for today. I'm going to submit the code to, uh, to GitHub. What is missing here is what I never done is this should actually really be dynamically filled, but it's not. It's hard coded, so you need to remember about that. Next week, I'm going to implement basically the same thing on Linux, and you will see that the it's uh, it's different on Linux because you have only one function which does everything which which here we did with like this function. Or, uh, or this function, or this function, everything you do with one function, which is called ptrace. So yeah, so let's do the same on Linux next week. And um, I guess that's, that's about it for today. So if there are any questions, I'm going to take them now. I am going again to put this code on GitHub. Uh, you know what, I'm going to actually put this in like go.bat so you know how to compile. And yeah. And we're going to also look for the uh, form I sent you from from guest created by guest. Okay, uh, I do actually. You will see the questions uh, down there. I saw a lot of Google job applications where you need a degree in computer science. Is that a must every time? Uh, no, uh, it's basically the way you read it is. Uh, Usually, and that's that's usually true. Not always, but usually, is that. Oh, uh, by the way, Pavel, thank you for for the donation. Um, it's a space space tab space. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, space is really cool. So back to the question. You you should read it like this. Um, you need. A degree in computer science or an equivalent in years in uh, experience. So that means you either have like I don't know five years of master's degree, right, which you've um, which you've done, or you have five years of professional experience, and that's that's uh, similar. 
from from that perspective. And usually when companies write, like companies usually say that, I don't know why Google doesn't, but yeah, I know quite a lot of people, really, really amazing people who didn't uh, go to universities and who are at Google. So that's totally possible. So it's not a must have, it doesn't need to be awesome. Easy. <laughs> No, I, uh, like, uh, in all honesty, the bar is pretty high. Uh, but do try, do try. I encourage you. Not too familiar with Windows is, if it's a void pointer that only makes sense in kernel memory, isn't that a broken case alarm? Um, okay, so I kind of simplified it there. You, you should think about the handle as an index into some array of handles. It's usually, like, as, you, as we saw here, somewhere before, um, where is, oh yeah, here is the value of the handle, right? This is, this is just, uh, oh, sorry, I'm not sh showing it, uh, here we go, yeah, here was the value of the handle, like, it's a small number which is an index into an array of handles, um, I don't think that's an exact index, I think it's like you have to do something like this, but it depends on the handle. There are different kinds of handles which are used in different ways. Handle is like a bag for several several descriptor-like types. But in this case, yeah, it's an index. It's not really an address. I'm using it as void pointer because um, it was one way of thinking about it, but it's not a pointer. It's, it's more like a opaque type, like and what void pointer is also an opaque type. But yeah, usually think about it as a number, and that's that's fine. It's really similar to a descriptor in in Linux. But uh, your question is spot on. If it would be a pointer, that would break KSLR. So yeah. If you don't want to leak handles, you could create a wrapper class around them and close them on destruction. Uh, that's not really true, because I would have to. So uh, I guess what you mean is when I get a handle from the API, I can create an object which will later um, deallocate it. But my problem with leaking handles is that there are quite a lot of debug exceptions which I don't handle, which potentially might have uh, might give me a handle which I have to close. And I'm not closing these handles. So, so that's where, where I'm leaking handles. And if I would handle them, I can just close them, right? Or if I would handle them, I could do as you suggest, and I can wrap them around some uh, some destructor, which will be called later on. But uh, yeah, if I'm handling them, it doesn't matter in the end. And the problem is that I'm just not handling them. It doesn't bo bother this code, by the way. It's something you should, if you'd be writing production code, you should take care of it. Hmm. And yeah, and. I, I do like the idea of wrapping things that are need to be destroyed, but need to be destroyed in, in classes. That simplifies the code. Uh, source acquisition is initialization. That's what's the official name for it, right? Don't you also read uh, need the red instruction there? Uh, yeah, who cares? You're right, and I did add the red instruction later on. So, yeah, thank you for noticing it, though I didn't notice your comment until now. What's the purpose of the naked attribute? I did explain that already. The DLL that gets injected into every process is done by running a processor, or, process, or is it possible to register a DLL in Windows so that it's in injected into every process? Um, so it's like this. There, uh, there is a DLL called user32dll, which is in most processes, you don't need them for you don't need it for console processes, but you need it for most of Win API. And um, when that DL is initialized, it looks under a registry key, which is called up in the DLL, something like that. And that's a registry key with DLLs. And the DLLs are going to be loaded when um, when user 32 is being loaded. We can check the details. So user 32 read uh, load dll's register registry whatever up in it yeah that's it yeah so this is this key um 
up in the DLLs under here. And basically, if you look there, there are probably some, some DLLs or we can, I guess we can check on my computer. On this computer, what's, what's there? Uh, did I disclose just some sensitive stuff? Yeah, registry can have funny stuff, so I'm going to do it off screen actually. Software Microsoft. Wow, so many keys. Windows NT, oh, not Windows, Windows NT. Current version. Windows. Oh, I don't have any. That's weird. I don't have any here. Maybe I have. Uh, oh, because I looked at local machine instead of current user. So my bad. Software Microsoft Windows. And I don't have it here. Ah, that's weird. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to look for for it. But um, I'm just going to give you a link in this case. It might not be there for Windows anymore. For Windows 10, it was years since I last looked at it. But that was the way it's used, it's used. and it's probably, there are probably other ways as well. What advice would you give to someone whom start working on vulnerability research, uh, training resources and so on? Uh, that's a good question. So if you're, well, first of all, do know your bug classes, as in if you're, for example, into low-level security, do learn what is a buffer overflow, what is used after free, uh, and so on and so on, because uh, that's what you will be looking for. And that's the first thing to learn. Apart from that, um, then you can use any resource for that, like CERT C Secure Coding Guide. I think that was from CERT or that was from SANS, maybe. I look for C Secure Coding Guide. They have a nice uh, list of quite a lot of potential bugs in C applications. Or if you're into more into PHP or something, then look for an equivalent uh, thing for for that. If you know the bug classes, then you can do a couple of things. First of all, do look for bugs. Uh, like get some targets, look for bugs, uh, review the code, fuzz the code, whatever works. Uh, this is the most important because reading about bugs and finding bugs are like two related but um, not identical activities. So that and apart from that, mm, looking at the bugs which people discover is also helpful because sometimes the bugs are really, really subtle and looking that someone like found this bug which looked like this in the code might enable you to to find similar bugs later on in other applications. So like two quick tips. I'm not sure they give you too much, but most important, look for bugs. Topic suggestion, production code versus normal code. What things you want to make sure in your production code in every way uh, to put it common mistakes. It's an interesting, interesting topic suggestion, uh, Dashim, so I'm going to note it. I'm probably not the best person to chat with related to... Um, oh, what happened? Oh, wait. Oh, that's funny. Daniel just got my, a message from me. Huh. It's because there's a tab here and EUC treats tabs as new completion. That's funny. Sorry, Daniel. Mm. Okay. Is it possible to use some anti reverse engineering techniques such as uh, nanomice for web assembly? Excellent question. I have no idea. I didn't look at um, web assembly yet. It's, it's possible in a lot of languages, so it might be. But 
then there are languages where it's not possible, so I'm not sure. It's, it's an excellent question, by the way. Okay, let's uh, finish it up here today. Thank you for Kshaku for being my moderator today. Thank you for coming after the break. And um, yeah, do let me know if you want more hardware-related streams later on, if there would be a chance, even if those streams wouldn't be as high level as uh, as these are. Let's assume these are high, high level. Okay, please, let's assume that. Thank you. And I see you next week for the poll, no, for the English one, where we will do the same, but in Linux using Ptrace. So that's it. Thank you, and see you. Next week I'm going to leave you with uh, some music, but sadly no mission today. Oh no, wait, 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 wait. We do need to review the answers for the... Uh, for... yeah, here. For the form from from the pop quiz from our uh, guests, so let's do that. Okay, here we go. So, um, most of you got... Yeah, but that's like a really nice normal distribution. Perfect. Okay, what's your skill? Uh, I think five was a beginner this time. Official software breakpoint opcode hex. Almost everyone got this correct. Yeah, these were these were pretty nasty, like traps. So well done on that. Official software breakpoint mnemonic is int free. Oh, nobody fell into my trap. Well done. Uh, someone said int one. Uh, I don't think there's an int1 instruction by very verse and space one, but that's something else. What, uh, which of the techniques uh, below can be used to make dumping the p um, can be used to make dumping harder? Yeah. Uh, stolen bytes, uh, which is true, changing, which is true. Virtual machines is again. Um, it doesn't make dumping the P harder. It makes uh, reading the code harder, but dumping, it doesn't change dumping in any way. So I, yeah, that's why I said no here, but you might disagree and we might want to discuss it, but yeah. The, the rest are fine as well. A process can't be debugged twice sim simultaneously. Yeah, it cannot. Like neither on Linux nor on Windows. Nanomites can't be mixed with other runtime anti-debugging and anti-dumping techniques. Yeah, they can. Like, totally. Why not? Okay. An overview of a nanomites technique, replacing branch instructions with nop, uh, a nop, no, like 90s, a nop. Um, so, no. This is true, of course, and uh, replacing all calls with push EIP jump target. No, because this is actually what call does. So this is replacing call with two instructions which do the same thing the call does, so no. Um, you cannot use Nanomites on Linux because it doesn't have a debugger API. Yeah, it does have a debugger API and we are going to use it next week. It's Ptrace. A common way to use Nanomites is to replace jump instructions in the child process. In such case, a jump table is generated and stored in the child process. The jumps are changed to in three instructions. Uh, not really, they are stored in the parent process because it doesn't make any sense to store them in the child process. That being said, if you thought about this question as, um, well, we have the same executable running twice, so they are used by the parent process from the parent memory, but they are also stored in the child process because it's the same executable. If that was your fo uh, thought process, then you got it right as well. So yeah, as you know, a little, um, I changed this question and maybe I didn't change it for the best. So my, uh, I'm sorry about that. Okay, um, first question is stupid. It's not, maybe, I don't know, maybe a little. Uh, you know, kruger donning effect that, that totally spoils the statistics like that when you, where you have to judge your skill. I love your streams, thank you. Um, why not post resource for beginners in Genvel stream EN? I don't complain, but Polish get a better streaming. I'm not sure if... I, in all honesty, I don't think I do anything different between the Polish and English streams right now. But was true in the past, but not right now. Cool. Okay. So again, uh, thank you for being here and see you next time. And thank you for Kshaku for being my moderator, guest for creating the pop quiz and 
you all for coming. See you next week. Bye-bye.